Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dr. X17, Dustin Campbell, and Tim Deputy. Coming up on DTNS, Apple gets a 10-year contract for all Major League Soccer matches, Adobe makes Photoshop free on the web, and Meta now offers a setting to garble the voices of strangers in Horizon Worlds. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 14th, 2022, Flag Day in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Mary. Happy Flag Day. It's Rudy Redmond. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, technology contributor to ABC News, author and host of The Tech John, Stephanie Humphrey. Hey there. Well, is good. today really Flag Day? It is, yeah. Oh, wow. I yeah, happy Flag Day. Whatever flag <laughs> you fly. Imagine if Tom was like, no, nah, it's not. <laughs> no, I just I made that kidding. up. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> Flag Day is when... Um, uh, Mike Claiborne, uh, uh, the longtime St. Louis Cardinals broadcaster, says, start paying attention to the standings. Don't pay attention to baseball standings before Flag Day. Wow, he uses Flag Day as a metric. That's his, yeah, that's his, that's awesome. his metric. So be like Mike Claiborne, I guess. Quick All right. fun fact. Yeah. Um, I live in a community right outside of Philadelphia called Yaden, Pennsylvania. And the creator of Arbor Day is from here. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I there couldn't you tell you his name, but <laughs> we have a whole big citywide celebration nice. every year for it. And yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm glad to see that Arbor Day gets some love out there. That's, That's good right. to know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's start off with a few tech things you should know. Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong announced that the company will lay off nearly 1,100 people, which is about 18% of its workforce. Coinbase quadrupled in size over the last 18 months. Laid off employees will lose access to company services and email immediately, but get a minimum of 14 weeks of severance pay with an additional two weeks for every year of employment. This might sound familiar to you because Coinbase is not the only company laying off people. Uh, Redfin and Compass also announced today layoffs of about 920 people collectively today, citing surging mortgage interest rates. WhatsApp is adding a feature in beta that lets users move chat histories, contacts, and your other WhatsApp data from Android to iOS. No more losing your history if you switch phones. It'll be a part of Apple's Move to iOS tool. Data will be moved and encrypted and then made available when you authenticate in WhatsApp on the new iPhone. You'll also get the option to back up WhatsApp data to iCloud if you want. Microsoft will end support for Internet Explorer on June 15th for most remaining versions of Windows that supported it, i.e. on the desktop will be disabled and replaced with Microsoft Edge. However, Windows 7 extended support, Windows 8.1, and all versions of Windows 10 long-term service client, IoT, and server will continue to make Internet Explorer available for the first uh, for the time being. IE 11 will continue to get security patches for those platforms as well. So it's not dead yet. Not, you know, just it's mostly, mostly gone. dead. Tom. It's mostly yeah. dead. Exactly. Uh, battery company called Our Next Energy, or One, O N E, announced a partnership with BMW to bring its Gemini dual chemistry battery pack to a prototype BMW iX EV by the end of the year. Uh, One's battery will use two types of cells and is experimenting with different electrode chemistries to reduce the use of cobalt, nickel, graphite, and lithium. It may offer three different sizes, including a low-end version at the same cost as current nickel and cobalt-based batteries. But here's the clincher if it works. One thinks its battery can almost double the IX's range from 324 miles to more than 600. Mozilla will make its total cookie protection feature on by default for desktop Firefox browser users. The feature keeps cookies isolated to the site on which they were created to prevent tracking, and the feature launched in 2021, but users had to turn it on at the time. Now, on by default. All right. Uh, let's talk a little more about what's going on at Adobe. Yeah, cool stuff. Adobe made some some announcements. Uh, Photoshop is getting a neural filter that can clean up old photos or photos that I don't know just need a little need a little help removing scratches, restoring color, that sort of thing. Adobe Lightroom, which can adjust images, will get the ability to handle video for the first time. You can color grade footage and trim down the uh, beginning and end on Lightroom if you use it. 
Yeah, so the the Lightroom thing is available in one version of Lightroom, but it's even more simplistic than this. So that's kind of nice. Uh, if you're a photographer who has a video clip, it's really not going to be useful for long uh, versions of video. But that neural filter, that's cool uh, for for you know t- taking old photos that you. Roger was was telling us before the show, like you could do all of that stuff in Photoshop. But what's cool about this mm-hmm. is it's one button; you can just click it. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I I use Photoshop pretty regularly i you know have certain things that i have to use it for but i'm not great at it <laughs> I, you know i kind of you know I, I i i have my little tricks but uh i i probably use photoshop like 15 percent of uh you know the what it is capable of something like this is one of the things that i want to use it for at the absolute most so i i, I can see a lot of people being happy about this yeah, that's a super cool feature. Um, the Lightroom thing, I, I thought that was like super niche. I was like, would anybody really need to do this like for real ever? Um, I, I don't I don't know why, like with with all the other tools available to do that kind of thing, like you know, why are we adding that feature to Lightroom? I don't know. Uh I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a go. You're a photographer who does a lot of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, could be. Yeah, it's which doesn't disprove the fact that that's very niche, even if that were it. Uh, we got another big one here. Adobe is testing a free web-based version of Photoshop in Canada with intentions to open it up to everybody, but right now Canadians get it. Uh, Adobe says the service is intended to be a freemium service at some point, but the core features will always be available for free to try out. More sophisticated features will eventually go behind the paywall. Adobe launched the web version of Photoshop back in October, but it's only been for subscribers up till now. Uh, it offers basic edit tools. It offers layers. Uh, they've been adding more features to it as they go. But Adobe is pitching it as being more than just a collaboration tool. When they first launched it, they said, eh, this is for making small tweaks and, and annotations uh, if you're sharing photos with each other. But it looks like they're now saying, we want it to be an entryway. We want, we want people to, to try Photoshop for free on the web. You could use it on a Chromebook, for instance, and then want to use it more and maybe eventually become a paying customer. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who I, I paid... Ten dollars a month for Photoshop on Creative Cloud, uh, it, it, and I feel that it's worth it because it's a very robust tool. Even though I'm not that great at Photoshop, um, this is you know for my my first reaction was like, ah, why does Canada get, Canada get everything first? My second was like, okay, well, what what exactly does Photoshop offer that I'm not using right now that is free, fully free? Where I I I would say, mm, okay, let me pay for this, you know, because I I like it so much, and I'm using you know certain tools that they're they're going to keep me back from on the free version. And see, I just you know I have a, such a disdain for the entire freemium model. I mean, I know you know this is capitalism, but it it always feels like bait and switch to me, mm. where you're getting people invested in using this particular tool under the auspices of it being free, um, and then you know flipping that switch when when they need it the most. And and I I think people that can pay for software kind of already do for the most part and and you would just be i think hamstringing hamstringing some people that actually could benefit from a truly free version of of the software yeah it depends on how they do it right and i guess that's part of the canadian test is is for us us as consumers to be able to to see that too so canadians let us know uh I think if it works like a free trial where it's like, this is how it works. If you like it and you suddenly are like, oh, I want to get more advanced than paying for it. That seems fair to me. Like it's it's free yeah. to free to use basically. But if you're becoming an advanced user, then, you know, go ahead and, and kick us a few bucks. If it's more like you're talking about, Stephanie, where it's like, oh, you could use it for, a you know, for a couple of things, but you won't be able to finish them because you're right. missing an essential thing. Then, yeah, that's that's not cool. I don't like that either. And as much as, you know, that whole suite cost as as is, it's just like, dude, like, what are you doing here? How much is this even going to cost? Like, why even bother? Just mm. let this be the one altruistic thing you do, Adobe. <laughs> Seriously. Well, in entertainment news, if you like soccer, Apple and Major League Soccer, or MLS, announced a 10-year broadcasting deal that makes the Apple TV app the home of all MLS matches. MLS Commissioner Don Garber said Tuesday that the league has the youngest, the most diverse, the most digitally native fans anywhere in the world. 
Some matches will be freely available to anybody with the Apple TV app, while the rest, including the MLS and Leagues Cup, will be part of Apple TV Plus, which is $4.99 per month. Yeah, there's some interesting things about this. It's a global deal, so they're getting the rights worldwide, uh, which is different than how sports leagues typically sell broadcast or streaming rights. They usually go country by country, region by region. Uh, MLS will also be allowed, and in fact, Apple is being encouraged, according to Eddie, Eddie Q, Apple has encouraged this, MLS will strike deals to simulcast matches on linear TV. Uh, my guess is they'll probably do this in local markets to say, oh, your local regional sports network or maybe your local broadcast channel will be able to show a match even if it is on Apple TV. So there won't be blackouts on this uh, for, again, for select matches. Uh, Apple's Eddie Q also said the deal is a huge opportunity for both of us because it's a partnership. It's not a rights deal. I don't know. <laughs> sounds like a rights deal to me. <laughs> sounds, but, yeah. sounds exactly like a rights deal. Exactly. Right? Right? I'm like, what's the definition of a rights deal? <laughs> yeah. um, I, this is interesting. What, when I when I read this, the, the first thing I thought about was that that whole thing that um, Saudi Arabia is doing with some of the professional golfers here in the United States that mm. had to leave mm. the PGA to play in that that live tournament. I don't know if it's live or LIV or mm -hmm. if those are Roman numerals, um, but it, it kind of reminded me of that. And, and the idea that, you know, these major sports organizations are, are kind of, you know, up to the highest bidder basically at this point. And, and, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that, but it just, I don't know. It, it, it just made me question a little bit the, the uh, motivations uh, from the MLS. I know why Apple would want this to happen, but um, you know, it's like now people won't be able to see some of the matches and it, it kind of, you know, ruins that experience for those folks. Well, but why won't they be able to see the matches? Well, the ones that get behind the Apple TV, the Apple TV plus, uh, oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, like they're 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 they'll right. be limited in some way. Like in, there in there will be a lot of free ones, but not all of them will be free. Some <laughs> right. of them will yeah. be five dollars a month. But unlike I don't know how that... sports viewing has gone <laughs> up until this day, I was gonna uh, say uh, I don't think that's that much. People. That's I don't know that that's that much different than what we get now, where you have to pay a cable subscription that sometimes is a lot more in order to get just a limited number. This is. You're paying five dollars a month for Apple TV Plus, which gives you all of Apple TV Plus and gives you access to the MLS stuff. And they're not blacking out local broadcast. So it's possible you might right. get some some local broadcast available without even having to have Apple TV. I mean, I get what you're saying, Stephanie, but I, yeah. I, I feel like compared to where we are now, it's still probably an improvement. Maybe I wonder about how this plays out everywhere else around the world where mm. soccer is way more popular, you know, and, and what type of access do Europeans and, and, you know, everybody else mm -hmm. have to the games in general and, and will they be impacted? I, I, I don't Supposedly know. Supposedly it's $5 a month, wherever yeah. you live in the world, if you can get Apple TV you can get it. Um, no, I mean like what, what's their status now? Like how, oh, how yeah. much I, access do they have to the games now? For our, for our, fun? this is our league, the U S league. They probably have to pay a lot. They probably have yeah. to pay some specialty provider. So okay. I would think this would bring it down if they're even interested because they have better soccer over there anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, a friend of mine who is much honest. more into soccer than me, um, I asked him about this this morning and he was like, this is amazing. But uh, this is also something that he doesn't have to discover because he already has an Apple TV. Mm -hmm. He's familiar with Apple, Apple TV+. Plus. I, you know, if you care, if you care about a, a sport enough to, you know, figure it out, you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure but, it uh, out. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of similar to what uh, the NFL did with Prime. Mm hmm. Yeah. Where they yeah. Uh, where they did they did the Thursday night games on Amazon yeah. Prime Video. And and now that's the only way you can get them is Amazon yeah. Prime Video. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the objections I'll expect to hear people say is like, well, I don't have an Apple device. And it's worth pointing out, if you don't already know this, that the Apple TV app is available on the web. It's on Roku, Fire TV, Google TV, Samsung, LG, Sony, yeah. Vizio, Panasonic, Hisense, PlayStation, Xbox. It's even available on cable boxes from Xfinity and Sky and Free and BTV. So it's available <laughs> if you want to install it and you've got one of those devices. All right. U.S. and Food, Food and Drug Administration has cleared a company called Rune Labs uh, to offer software called Strive PD, 
This tracks the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So it uses Apple's Movement Disorder API and an Apple Watch with the Apple Watch sensors to track things like tremors, which is one of the main symptoms of Parkinson's. And it also lets patients add symptom reports and medication usage on their own. Strive PD is meant to let clinicians track a patient's progress and monitor changes. So this is through your doctor. This is not like an app you download and, and pay a subscription for. It provides a better look than patient recall and be, can be used to fine tune medications. It will also help enroll patients in clinical trials uh, to develop new treatments and bring those to the market more quickly. Rune Labs is not the only company working on this sort of thing with the Apple Watch. Uh, the Verge notes a company called Cerebellia is also developing an app related to Parkinson's as well. But what perked my ears up about this is it's a service going to the doctors that treat this to help them rather than a service trying to get you to pay $5 a month to maybe come up with useful data that then they'll leak out on the internet anyway. So they're not doing that last thing is what <laughs> is what I'm pointing out. I think this is I think this is uh, this is good. I think this is significant. It's interesting. Now, this is super cool. I was just thinking that, you know, I, I, I hope there is a way or someone could figure out a way to get Apple watches into the hands of folks in low income communities that have Parkinson's because, I mean, you know, mm. this is this is wonderful. And, and there's already an app. Uh, I believe there's already an app that does this for on the smartphone, but uh, if there was some way to do some sort of partnership yeah. um, to, to get uh, more Apple watches into more hands so that they could take advantage of the software, that'd be great. Especially yeah. as these kinds of devices get used for more of these kinds of things and not even just the Apple watch, you can work for Fitbits and, and other devices from Samsung and others too, to be able to say, Hey, this is going to be able to help health in general. Let's, right. Let's make it available. Let's figure out how to get it in, into people's hands. Like you're saying, I think that's great. Yeah. Sometimes it, it kind of becomes a conversation of like, well, yeah, everybody with Parkinson's disease would love to have an Apple watch, but you know, how many exactly. actually have them? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I um, <laughs> I've got, you know, I, um, I, I have another friend story. A, a friend of mine's mother has Parkinson's and I, I sent her this article this morning. I said, does your mom know about this? And she goes, oh yeah, yeah. She's on the list. So um, I think oh, it's, uh, I, th I think this is somewhat slow going because uh the um the food and drug administration saying okay we're good with strive but strive has to then say okay we're good with you patient because yeah, right. you know you have all, you have all the you know the the uh the symptoms that are necessary for this to work um is 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 you know there there's there's some moving parts here yeah no that's a really good point the news here is the fda approval that doesn't mean magically right. it appears on everybody yeah right yeah uh, well, folks, if you're feeling social, uh, get in touch with us. The DTNS audience is available, or we are available to the DTNS audience, I should say, on uh, DTNS Show on Twitter and DTNS Picks, P I X, on Instagram. Well, Meta is introducing some new features for its VR products. VR enthusiasts, listen up. VR safety tools announced in March are now rolling out to the Oculus app. A dashboard lets parents and guardians see a teen's list of friends, list of apps, blocked apps on the, on the account. Parents can also see headset time and get alerts when apps are purchased. Uh, so more or less just, you know, making sure that they know what the teens are doing on VR. Teens can also request permission to buy age-restricted apps. So before we get to the other uh, the other aspect here, which is that Horizon Worlds thing I teased at the top of the show, uh, this this feels unremarkable. Is there, is there anything of note here? Does Stephanie, I know you follow this space pretty closely. Like It, it just feels like kind of minimum expected stuff for parental It is controls. the bare minimum, yeah. unfortunately, but... But when you hadn't done the bare minimum, you know, stepping up to that, I guess, feels like progress to folks. It's better than um, nothing. It's, it's yeah. funny. The um, the part about the the parental controls have to be initiated through the teens account, I think, is still 
lagging behind what most of the other platforms do with the exception of Instagram. They, they were mentioned in this article as well. They just flipped it so that the parents can actually send the, send a teen a request and say, Hey, you have to, you know, you got to let me get access to your phone to get these parental uh, controls in place. So um, we'll see if they, if they do something similar to that for, for the Oculus, but, but yeah, I, I don't know why Meta, wants to take these baby steps um, as it relates to how parents can can parent their kids and their devices. All right, let's talk I about mean, the, the other. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. Well, I was just, I was just going to say it's probably because Oculus has become so popular, especially with young people, that n the company was like, huh, we didn't really think about that. They never do. You know, we, should we should probably make sure <laughs> that, uh, you know, teens are a little bit safer than they have been in the past. They never do. All right. Uh, Meta's Horizon Worlds VR chat app is launching in the UK, adding uh, that to Canada and the US, the US, and getting new options for voice chat. Right now, voice chat is on by default. Uh, that's not changing. You might be like, oh, yeah, they need to turn that off. No, it's still on by default uh, when you enter Horizon Worlds. But you're getting a new setting called voice mode over the next few weeks that will let you disable that. So you can say, I don't want to hear anybody talking to me unless they're my friend that I've approved. I don't want to hear them. Or even I think more interesting, you'll have an option called garble voices from strangers. Garble voices lets you know a person is talking by playing what uh, Meta describes as unintelligible, friendly sounds. <laughs> uh, we can all do our version of that later. Uh, and then if you want to hear what that person is saying, you can raise a hand to your avatar's ear to temporarily hear them without having to add them as a friend and then decide if you want to have a conversation, I guess. Uh, when garble mode is on, an icon will appear above your avatar of an ear crossed out to indicate that you're unable to hear people. I assume that help, happens if you've disabled it altogether as well. But uh, I don't know. Garble, 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 garble. <laughs> Well, here's what, and Stephanie, I don't, I don't know how much VR you, you know, you're, you're, you're doing on a daily basis. Um, I play a lot of VR exercise games. I'm mm -hmm. not in Horizon Worlds, but it, I know what it is, and I know it's a, you know, it's a way for people to meet friends all over the world, just like any other place on the internet, right? It's just a VR version of that. The, the unintelligible, friendly sounds <laughs> from somebody who might not actually be friendly towards me is, is kind of, uh, it's. It's an interesting choice. It is. It is. I, I, I'm like, what? What is that even? Like, I, I just, you know, the the idea that, and even the idea that you would raise your hand to speak. I feel like, you know, the the realist in me, Tom, um, am I'm already thinking through ways to abuse this. This uh -huh. feature, um, because, you know, you could have two people sort of tag teaming someone, you know, you raise the hand to listen to one thinking that they're going to say something, you know, normal when this other person now, you know, starts shouting and yelling and screaming at you that that was the thing I was like, you know, you should be able to do that individually, if you're going to be able to do it at all, um, you should be able to do it individually with the people that you're not friends with like it seems like if you have the garble on everybody you're not friends with is garbled so i i think you should be able to kind of toggle that on without having to raise the hand just because there may be someone you want to speak to but there may be somebody you don't want to speak to in the same room at the same time and and you're gonna you know i could just see that going left very very quickly yeah i i agree with you there should be a, a an unmute setting for individuals in a particular chat room that you're like, I don't want to go so far as to put them on my friends list permanently. And every time right. I run into them, but I've raised my hand, I found out that, you know, they're not, they're not crazy. And, and they're, ha they're saying interesting things, right. I, but I don't have to keep my hand up to listen to them uh, either. So yeah, it would be nice if there was a, a middle ground. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting way to solve a problem of, of, because I, I assume if you turn it off entirely, it's like you just don't know they're talking, right? You you wouldn't have any indication. So this is a way to let you know, like, hey, people are saying something to you. You can decide if you want to take the risk of listening or not. And that seems I like mean, a lot distracting, of, uh, too. Oh, go ahead. You're just hearing garbled. But it's friendly. There you go. <laughs> I mean, a lot of this when I, you know, at first I was like, what are they doing? And then I was like, 
you know, this isn't unlike what social networks have been trying to solve for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. Is okay, you know, is somebody my friend? Great. You know, we talk back and forth. Maybe I don't want to add them as a friend, but they can DM me. Maybe they can't do either of those things. Um, and that is just the VR world we're in now. Yeah. I'm imagining it like Simlish. Some kind of, you know, these poor words on a little bit of thing, you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but very friendly. I'm going to have to try this out. But friendly, friendly garbling. Yeah, you're going to make me uh, put my VR headset on later on just to I hear know. some friendly garbling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, same, same. Now I have to see. I have to see how it works. Everybody send me friendly. We're going to start unfriending uh, each other just so uh, we can hear garbling. <laughs> <laughs> Unintelligible stuff. Send it to me. Um, well, something that you also might be interested in is a company called Modos based out of Boston developing something called the paper laptop, which has a black and white electronic paper display. You might say, uh, what is that? Well, it's like e-ink. It's like a Kindle. The team says that great battery life, less eye fatigue and better visibility in bright sunlight is its goal because the majority of laptop users really are using their devices for things like email, spreadsheets, word processing and other text-focused tasks, not really, you know, rich stuff, where e-paper obviously excels and the battery life uh, is really good too. Web browsing will obviously be different without a full-color screen, but Modus has done work on an e-paper monitor that can achieve 60 frames per second refresh rates, making scrolling web pages and full-speed video playback very smooth. Yeah, this is still in the development phase, uh, but that video they showed of, of the prototype was pretty impressive to me. If you're they, like, they played video it, it, they're like, well, we're working on dithering and grayscale right now. Uh, so it, it doesn't look great, but it worked like the, the, it would, the, the refresh rate was enough that, that it actually worked. And the other thing I thought was, was fancy about it is uh, it, it could just scroll and, and do forms and pretty much all the things I use my Chromebook for. It could do, and it's going to have like a month long battery life because it's an e ink screen. I'm, I signed up for the yeah. survey. I was like, all right, I want to find out more about this. Like, I'm into it. Um, I'd be curious what the specs of the laptop are going to be. Um, did they say that anywhere in there? No, because they're still um, just developing the display yeah, technology. That, yeah. That's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, you know, is this different than a reader with a keyboard attached to it? Um, like, could you just, could you fashion this out of a Kindle like currently? And, no, because the refresh rate is abysmal is bad, on a yeah. Kindle. That That's their secret sauce, right? Okay. Well, it, it could be a, a thing. Um, I was, I was, uh, I was pleasant. I was pleased to hear them talk about the idea of, um, this being a way to distract you because grayscale in your phone is is mm -hmm. largely agreed as, as a way mm -hmm. to not use your phone so much so i i like that they put that in there because i think that's probably going to be um an actual significant selling feature for this for this thing yeah 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 if you don't yeah, need it to play video games you know this this could be the thing well, I think a lot of us, myself included, you know, when when I first read the story this morning, I was like, "What? No, a laptop that doesn't have color." But how many how many things do I really need that for? Sure, uh, rich video, definitely so. Um, even though video is working on the Modus laptop, uh, the paper laptop, but but most things, most of my day to day things are, you know, task oriented work stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think that. Yeah, I, especially if you're, well, I don't, I don't know who's doing a lot of traveling in these days, but as as the world sort of comes back to life, I think that you know this starts to be really attractive uh, to folks who are you know on the go, and yeah, the battery life in particular is a big selling point. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Josh. Josh says, thought it was interesting. He's talking about yesterday's show that Rich mentioned that authors could put notation on each word so that an audiobook AI could read the words and then place emphasis where the author desired. Reminded me of any kid who's had to learn to chant from the Torah and the notations on each word that teach you the appropriate musical notes. It's called trope, a 4,000 year old solution to a modern problem. Hey, so uh, sometimes the old ways are best, right? Josh? Yep. Yeah. You know? There is nothing new under the sun. 
<laughs> That's great. Uh, and then Bodhi, uh, host of the Kilowatt uh, podcast, uh, wrote in and said, hey, if you're interested in an affordable electric vehicle with solar panels, because we were talking about uh, the big expensive one uh, yesterday that that's coming from uh, who was it? Uh, uh, um, oh, man, I'm, I'm blanket on the name suddenly. But but yeah, we were talking about the the big expensive one that, that's coming. That's like 200,000 euros. Uh, Bodhi says. How about the Aptera, A-P-T-E-R-A? It's a two-seater, three-wheeled vehicle with solar panels. It's not quite an apples-to-apples comparison. In some states, it's classified as a motorcycle. The Lightyear, thank you, Bodhi. The Lightyear Zero has got a a big price difference. The base model of the Aptera starts at $25,900 for 250 miles. The maxed-out Aptera claims a range of 1,000 miles. And with all the options, it would cost you $50,700, which is still a quarter of the price of the Lightyear Zero. Production of the Aptera should begin soon if it hasn't already. Is there a top speed on that thing? Because that thing looks pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it's a two-seater, right? So you're, you, this is not high capacity. But yeah, it looks like like the, you know, it at least can get uh, zero to 60 miles per hour in three and a half seconds. So right. yeah, that's decent. Well, thank you to Bodhi. Thank you to Josh. And thank you to everybody who writes in with questions, comments, feedback, all the things. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to direct your email our way. Thank you in advance. We love your feedback. Also, thanks to Stephanie Humphrey for being with us today. Stephanie, where can people keep up with what you've been up to? They can follow me all around the web at Tech Life Steph. You can check out my website at till death you tweet.com and of course please listen and download the tech john at the tech john j-a-w-n.com yeah if for no other reason to get rob dunwood's secret basketball name (laughs) that's right (laughs) he has a secret basketball name oh yeah yeah oh gosh now i'm clearly behind on my episodes (laughs) no the tech john's awesome and so are you stephanie thank you for being with us also thanks to our brand new boss whose name is Jason. Jason just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Jason. Jason, you're the best. You could be the next Jason. Just back us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Fanfare is yours tomorrow if you want it. There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. We roll right into it as we wrap up DTNS, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Join us live if you can. We'd love to have you. And we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 